My name is Jason Nez and I am a fire archaeologist here in northern Arizona and I go out on different assignments and help fire management deal with cultural resources in fire on the fire line and in um, post burn areas. Today we're going to go over some of the equipment I carry when I go out on an assignment. There's different types of assignments. There's local assignments where we leave from our local agency with our own vehicle and there's um, out of district assignments where we'll have to fly and we'll be carrying all manner of gear when we go out on these different assignments. So I usually carry a backpack because I'll be going through airports and I'll want to carry books. I'll carry sensitive equipment. I, I usually bring my own laptop with different software I can use, uh, GIS software so I can download shape files, waypoints. I can rename them. I can edit them make them easier to send to the local archaeologists or for my own office. I usually carry all of my resource orders on my clipboard. So I want my resource order and if you're an AD you want your casual hire form and you want all of that information where you can easily get to it in just as you're traveling as a matter of convenience. And then when I'm actually on my assignment I'll be carrying all of my, my maps the, that you get at the uh, briefing, it'll show your fire perimeter, your local resource maps. You would also clip them in here, showing uh, locations of like sensitive resources, um, sketch paper for drawing in case you find something really neat and you want to sketch it out in the, the little time you have. And also your IAP for the day, showing all of your radio frequencies, your divisions, your points of contact, and all of that information. And I just carry this in travel and also when I'm on the line. And post, post fire forms, I carry like five of these. Then I can make Xerox copies at the incident. And this just shows us our sites that we found, the damage that happened. If it's a new site, we can start doing some basic recording, some of the fire effects, suppression impacts, erosional threats, and all of that. And they come in a handy form that we carry around. And just tons of notebooks that I, I fill up throughout the day. I carry all of my um, all of my dongles for for uh, charging my phone, for interfacing with the computer, and all of that. I usually carry in the truck as I'm going out through the day. And I carry my fire gear, my line gear, usually. And one of these convenient bags they sell just for like hiking and stuff, but you can stuff everything in one bag and it keeps things from scattering all over the place. When you're driving, let's say my assignments in New Mexico and things are gonna fly all over my truck because I'm driving around and, or when I'm in flight, everything is in here in a compact uh, case where it won't get all over the place. And as a firefighter, I wear a yellow helmet, but as a resource person, I carry my orange helmet. And in the park service, we have sort of a, a coat that orange is for resources, yellow is for fire, red is for uh, engineers and captains and, and so forth. I also have my, I have my hood on it. I like my hood because when it's hot, you can just bring it down and cover your neck a little bit. I carry tons of tape. I'm within the weight limits, which would be 50 pounds, so I carry tons of tape because you never know what they're going to have. Sometimes they'll have tape, sometimes they won't, sometimes they'll be like a week before they can order it. So I have orange tape, hazard tape, yellow tape, pink and black and white. So I can mark out, I can mark out resources, uh, nests, I can mark out uh, little field houses or artifact scatters if I need to. And then, my line gear. So, when my water's full, this can be up to 50 pounds, but that's what we train for, and that's why we stay physically fit, is so we can carry all of this. So, I also carry my water bottles empty, because you can't fly with them. And they're a lot of weight that you can fill up when you get to your area. And I like my thermos because during the day I like my hot water and if something crazy comes up and I got to spend the night I can fill it with coffee. 
And for firefighters, we generally have to carry at least four quarts of water. But as you'll find out, we're not going to have we're not going to have a lot of room to work with. So I like to use these uh, quart and a half bottles, so I can stick like a trimble in here. I can stick uh, different knickknacks I'll need through the day in here because different resources I'll be carrying duct tape, might be carrying um, HVAC tape. Uh, items like that. HVAC tape, uh, can you explain that? Uh, HVAC tape is a tape we use for wrapping shelters. So when we're wrapping, a, a, like there's an old cabin and we wrap it with a foil shelter, we want to use HVAC tape on the seam so it can resist heat and it won't allow a fire to get to it. And uh, your yellow, which stays here. And this is just your typical yellow, and they have a new fabric. I think it's called Pekasafe, which is a lot more breathable and doesn't chafe as much. But when I'm when I'm walking line all day, I like to have uh, one of the other types of shirts, which has all these vents that you can open up. So when you're walking 20 miles a line out on Fort Hunter Liggett in August, and it's 100 degrees, like you're going to want all of these vents to, to be able to breathe through, and that's just part of part of the additional weight and willing to carry. So we have our water bottles and we carry tons of notebooks, tons of toilet paper, an extra headlamp. And for this particular, the way I have it set up, I also have it set up for uh, my main job this season, firefighting. So I have an additional three liters of water. So we have three here and three here. So that's six total liters of water. So I'd be good for being self-sufficient all day, but as an archeologist or resource advisor, you'll hopefully be working out of your vehicle. So you'll be able to get back to it in, in a decent, timely manner and refill your water and not have to carry so much gear. And one of the things we also carry is our, uh, this isn't a fire shelter. This is just like a ground mat, like a tarp or reflective. So if you want to signal a helicopter, you can lay it on the ground and say, hey, we put a panel marker out there, don't dump water on that old uh, teepee or wiki up or something. And it's handy for marking things and for, if it's raining, you can just crawl under it. Looks like it would also be a good emergency signaling. It would be, yeah, because you can flip the, the backside and it's reflective in here. So if something happens, which it won't, because we're all highly trained and we know what we're doing. <laughs> you can easily signal aircraft overhead or someone on the next hill or just leave it on the ground like I was right here. So it's pretty, pretty handy. And part of our firefighting gear that we're required to carry is two MREs which I guess some people have argued down to one, but I carry two because I can handle the weight. But they're not the best, and it's worth your while to rummage through your cash or trade for meals you like. Uh, like this this one is probably from the 90s, like Gulf War One vintage, and this is one of the newer, tastier ones. And panel markers. So sometimes in our job, we've got to mark uh, Features out there when they're dropping uh, PSP, so they're dropping fire down, and we don't want them to hit certain structures that we've lined and prepped. So we'll flag them out with these, so the helicopter can see them from the air. And this just stretches out. So we have our water. We have. Uh, I carry just in case, never had to use them, I carried these for like seven years, they probably got to get new ones, but glow sticks, if something comes up, you just break them, you can leave a trail at night, or you can clip into your gear, people can see you, and as part of my specialized resource gear, I carry uh, folding loppers, so sometimes you get out to the site, and the fire's moving a bit aggressively, and there's not enough resources to spare to send a crew to help do a fuel reduction or cut back the brush around your site. So you just show up with these and start lopping, mercilessly lopping and pulling back fuels from your so system. With my loppers and my hand tool out, the next little bit of equipment I have is uh, my radio. So over time, I've gotten a remote mic for my radio. 
And this way, if when I'm out doing dozer hops or just when I'm out walking line, it keeps my radio free and handy in case someone finds something and they call me over. And they also have my GPS attached to my pack because sometimes a bush will grab it or something will throw it off and you're never going to find it. So I keep it right here and this way I can keep manipulating it with my fingers and I can just let it hang and I'm fine. And all of this can be up to like 50 pounds, 45 pounds and that's just part of why we train and stay in shape. Okay. And I also have with my gear that I've picked up over the years is a little whip antenna. And I can quickly replace my antenna when I'm out on assignment and that way I can get a little better reception out there and I just keep it in the pipe. That way it keeps it from getting bent. And then in my vehicle kit I have all sorts of extra tape. I have uh, my GPS, my personal GPS just because as an AD sometimes you get a rental vehicle or a, you get some weird forest service vehicle that's like 20 years old that doesn't have all these in it. And you can easily find like four service roads and different two tracks. Sometimes they're on here. And it's real handy when you're in an assignment in an area that you're not familiar with. Extra batteries. Um, and I have all sorts of just random file folders in here that hang because you can go to your uh, supply when you're in a big incident and you can just grab a box or you can get a crate or just something to keep your paperwork organized. Because you're going to accumulate a lot of paperwork. I keep old IAPs in here, I keep old maps in here that change every other day. I have envelopes for resource orders. I keep, like my mileage is all scribbled down and all of that I'm keeping track of. And as I'm doing post-fire forms or I'm doing new site forms, I'm just sticking them in, I'm keeping them organized. So the next archaeologist that comes along behind me, I can just throw it all on them. Or if you're like crazy like me and you stay on an assignment for three months, then everything's organized for that whole time period. Things start to get messy, they roll all over the cab, and you'll definitely appreciate having your gear organized. And, and copies of your um, Red Dog, your, your time yeah, suits. And so as part of my, my gear too, at the end of an assignment, I keep everything together. And one of the most important things is your OF-288, your Red Dog. So if you're an AD, you'll need that to get paid. But if you're a regular uh, GS employee, you'll be able to take pictures or scans of your, P your CTRs and send them back every day, or you can have your finance section take care of that for you. So next is our two-week bag. And for my two-week bag, I just have the basic necessities, a tent, a ground mat, and keep in mind that some of the bigger fires are going to be rocking and rolling and you'll be moving every other day. So sometimes I don't even set up a tent. But if you're a lead read or a lead archie, set up your tent. You're probably going to be there for a while. Going to late meetings and early morning, pre-meeting meetings and pre-post-morning meetings and stuff like that. And this is just my basic read gear. Most of my equipment's in my firefighting two-week bag, which is over at the canyon. So first of all, if you're flying, I have my name. I sometimes stick a copy of like half of my red card in here. So if it gets lost in travel, they can at least try to find you. And it's just really basic. Sometimes you'll get out to camp late and all you'll be able to do is put out your ground mat and sleep on it. And that's what I do a lot. And sometimes it's just the back of the truck. But another uh, space blanket, you will appreciate having a real pillow. You'll think that bunching up your clothes or bunching up a sweater will work. Uh, it won't. <laughs> I'm 40 now, so I want to be as comfortable as possible. And I have two sleeping bags. I have a heavy winter weight bag that I carry or my summer bag. And my summer bag, it squishes down even smaller than that. So it's something to think about is have two different kinds of sleeping bags for different years. And another thing I carry for comfort is a wool blanket. Because you're out there, it's hot and sweaty, it's like 90 degrees at night, and you just start sweating when you touch that synthetic sleeping bag, you're gonna want this. And sometimes that's all you need is just sleep on the ground using your wool. Inflatable air mattress, that ground gets hard and cold. And normally I carry my slippers because you're walking all day, you're walking dozer line all day, you're hiking all over the place. You're going to want non-fire boots to, to get it. I guarantee you, you're going to want to 
let your feet air out. So you want your slippers or old holy tennis shoes. And I carry a um, poncho liner too. So it's just a military style poncho liner. You can sleep under it. You can use it as a bag or a, you can wrap yourself in it. You can layer up with it. You can make a shade out of it. All sorts of cool stuff. But if you got the space for it, anything to make you comfortable will help. Uh, just regular paracord. Sometimes you want to string something up, something to dry your clothes. And for my AD gear, my, my AD gear, I have a personal tent. This one just folds up into like a big teepee. All I got to do is set up my instant center pole and then stick out the sides and I have a quick, quick, fast shelter. If I'm going to be there a while, there's a bug netting I can set up so I can just leave my gear and I don't have to worry about spiders and scorpions and all sorts of nasty critters coming in on me. And something, just because I have room, is a bug bivy. So sometimes you just want to sleep on the ground, it's too hot. So I just put out my bug bivy and I'll be sleeping in my, on top of my bag and under a blanket. It's too hot to really do anything else. Tent stakes and normally I have my, um, normally I have an extra set of yellows in here because that's what we're required to carry for fire. Extra socks, extra underwear, uh, just a regular t-shirt. Some people will carry like a regular civilian shirt and shorts, but usually a, I don't get to leave camp, so I don't carry all the extra stuff. I carry my poncho, and this is the one with the tail that you can cover your gear when it rains. Um, extra clamshells, bug netting, and there's a lot of, you shouldn't be in a situation where you have to wear like a gnomic hoodie, but sometimes if it's really cold, you can just stick them on and stay warm or something. And it's just some, I haven't tried it yet. It's theoretical. Extra headlamp. So all of this stuff is part of your gear you can carry. Is that, the, also, is that a kitchen sink in there? Somewhere in here. We'll find it. Somewhere in here is a giant kitchen sink. So. <laughs> so most of your gear is also listed in your firefighter handbook, your red book that people have available, but you don't have to carry it all the time. And you have to think in terms of like we're firefighters and we're resource advisors. So you have to think of the stuff you have to carry for fire in case you've got to go out and dig line. And you also got to think about what you need to accomplish your specific mission. Whether you're going out to wrap a shelter, a shelter that's near the road, you're just getting out of your truck, or a shelter that you got to walk up on a mountain. And then you got to get up, you got to meet the helicopter and the hand crew and start coordinating how to wrap it. So you got to think about your mission. And as you get more experience and as you do these things seven years now, it just becomes part of your thought. You don't have to think too much about it. So Jason, when you're um, arriving on a fire, uh, what is it that you're hoping uh, to receive from the land manager? When I get out on an assignment and I arrive at the local resource area, one of the first things I do is I check in at camp. So you got to get in, you got to check in, you got to let them know you're there figure out where you're going to camp and all that, and then find your local archaeologist. So if you're in a forest, there'll be a forest archaeologist, and, and in a park, there'll be a park archaeologist. So there's just different people who are in charge of managing that resource. And when I get over there, I, get, I talk to them, what's going on, and what might be out there, what's their main concern. And your concern can be anything from historic lookouts to pueblos to... Uh, terrace gardens that are out there that are sensitive to dozer activity so you want to know your main priorities right away and a good agency or a good unit will have that all set out at Grand Canyon for example we have our resource advisor binder so if there's an incident anyone can go in usually me and go in and just open up our binder and look at our map and say here's our fire here's where it's expected to go and I have these fire sensitive resources and we have our resources Divide it into fire sensitive, medium sense like medium sensitivity and low sensitivity. So my first priority is get out to my fire sensitive structures. They could be structures, they could be rock art, they could be um, like a, a a thermal ground complex of, of, of features. Like any of those things are what I'm gonna get on first. So you want to know these things. You want to get your maps, and if possible, you want to have shape files. So 
we should all by now we should all know how to use ArcMap or some sort of GIS software. And if not, as a resource, it's it's a good idea for you to learn about it. For all of us that are going out as reads or archies to learn about GIS and how to use it because there, believe it or not, there are still units that people have no clue what GIS is. They still have a ton of paper. Sometimes they'll have GIS data and you might be you might just get a stack of paperwork, you know, what am I gonna do with it? And sometimes it'll take you getting that stack of paperwork, looking at those UTMs, and then going to your computer or the park computer or the forest computer, inputting that and making your own shape files and putting it on your GPS so you can get to it. So if you invest your time in compiling your data when the fire runs or when it stops, you'll be able to look at your GPS unit and instantly see what's out there. And if you've done everything correctly, you'll have a description and all that. Or you can just carry a paper copy and spend time looking at your GPS, trying to figure out where this is at or where it's not. So there's a lot of ways you can save yourself time and it just takes experience into putting that information together. But at a basic, your local unit should have maps of where artifacts or, or where fire sensitive items are, where features that could be damaged by ground activity and the different things they want taken care of from endangered species to to Pueblos. All of that should be available to you or made available to you.